Hello there, MSO here and welcome to this IFRS 16 summary video on a standard that specifies how an IFRS reporter would recognize, measure, present and disclose their leases. This standard has been through a number of changes right from July 2006 when it was on the ISB's agenda all the way through to January 2016 when the current form of IFRS 16 as we have it today was issued. By the International Accounting Standards Board. Now, as a standard, IFRS 16 leases was issued in January 2016 and it applies to annual reporting periods beginning on or after 1st January 2019. This standard, when it was issued, came to supersede or replace a number of standards and interpretations. The first was IS 17 leases. This was the old lease standard the next superseded standard for interpretation was ifric 4 which gave the rules around determining whether an arrangement contains a lease the next superseded standard was sic 15 which provided rules around operating lease incentives and finally sic 27 has also been superseded by ifrs 16. sic 27 gave the rules around evaluating the substance of transactions involving the legal form of a lease. So now that we know all of these superseded stuff in a little bit of history, what is the objective of IFRS 16? Why was the standard issued? IFRS 16 establishes the principles for the recognition, the measurement, the presentation, and the disclosure of leases with the objective of ensuring that lessees and lessors provide relevant information that faithfully represents all those transactions. So with this out of the way, what is the scope of IFRS 16? What things are within IFRS 16 scope and what things are outside the scope of the standard? First key principle to remember is that IFRS 16 applies to all leases, including subleases, except for a number of situations. The first exception is for leases to explore for or use minerals, oil, natural gas, and similar non-regenerative resources. The next exception or exclusion from the scope will be leases of biological assets held by a lessee. These will typically be accounted for under IAS 41 Agriculture. The next exception is for service concession arrangements, which will fall under the scope of IFRIC 12 service concession arrangements. Also out of scope of IFRS 16 is any licenses of intellectual property granted by a lessor. These will fall under IFRS 15 revenue from contracts with customers. And finally, any rights held by a lessee under licensing agreements for items such as films, videos, plays, manuscripts, patents, and copyrights that fall within the scope of IES 38 intangible assets will all be outside the scope of IFRS 16 leases. Remember also that the LSE has a right to elect to apply IFRS 16 to leases of intangible assets other than those that I specifically mentioned not too long ago. So now that we know what the scope is, what items are excluded or exempted from being recognized as leases under IFRS 16. So the rule is that instead of applying the general recognition requirements that I'll talk about shortly, LSC has the right to elect to account for lease payments as an expense on a straight line basis over the lease term or over another systematic basis for two main classes or types of leases. The first, is leases with a lease term of 12 months or less and that contain no purchase options. Remember here that this election is made by class of underlying assets. The second category is for leases where the underlying asset has a low value when it's new. Examples will include personal computers or small items of office furniture. Once again, this election can be made on a lease by lease basis. So now that we know what is excluded from being recognized as a lease or what's exempted, how do we identify a lease in the first place? 
we say a contract is a lease or a contract contains a lease if it conveys the right to control the use of an identified asset for a period of time in exchange for consideration. Now talking about control a lot more, control can be said to be conveyed when the customer has both the right to direct the identified assets use and to obtain substantially all the economic benefits from that particular use. It's important to remember this key principle. And let me mention that where a supplier has a substantive right of substitution throughout the period of use, then we can say really that a customer does not have a right to use an identified asset per se. Now let's look at the rules when it comes to separating components of a contract. So here we're talking about for cases where a contract contains a lease component and additional lease and non-lease components. For example, a lease of an asset and the provision of a maintenance service together as one bundled contract. We are saying in such cases, the lessee is required to allocate the consideration payable on the basis of the relative standalone prices which shall be estimated if observable prices are not readily available. And once again, let me mention that LSC may elect by class of underlying assets not to separate non-lease components from lease components and to decide to account everything as what a lease. Then finally, lessors are required to allocate a consideration in accordance with IFRS 15 revenue from contracts with customers. Now that we know all of these rules, how are lessees required to account for leases under IFRS 16? So the rules are straightforward. Upon the commencement of the lease, a lessee recognizes something called a right of use asset and also recognizes at the same time a lease liability. How is the right of use asset measured? The right of use asset is initially measured at the amount of the lease liability plus any initial direct cost incurred by the lessee. Also, adjustments will be required to be made for things such as lease incentives, payments at or prior to commencement, and restoration obligations or similar other obligations. Now, after commencement of the lease, a lessee is required to measure the right of use asset using a cost model unless something happens. Unless what happens specifically, what I'm saying here is that the right of use asset, there are a number of options. If it is an investment property and the lessee fair values the investment property under the fair value model of IES 40 investment property, or the next is the right of use asset relates to a class of PP to which the lessee applies IES 16's revaluation model. In which case, all the rights of use assets relating to that class of PPE can be revalued. Let me mention here, however, that the fair value model under IS 40 is not the same as the revaluation model provided for under IS 16 property plans and equipment. So here, take note, the cost model will be the default unless the um, lessee is already accounting for the leased asset under IS 40's fair value model or under IS 16's revaluation model. How will the cost model look like? So under the cost model, a right of use asset will be recognized, guess what? At the cost model under IS 16 property, plant and equipment. And here, what IS 16 provides for is that the asset will be measured at the cost, less any accumulated depreciation, and less any accumulated impairment losses, which will obviously be defined or determined under IES 36, impairment of assets. Now that we know how the right of use assets will be measured, how will the lease liability be measured? The lease liability is initially measured at the present value of the lease payments payable over the lease term. Remember this, but this will be discounted at the rate implicit in the lease if that can be readily determined. If that rate cannot be readily determined, then the lessee shall use the incremental borrowing rate to do the discounting. So this is for the lease liability. But take note, there's something known as variable lease payment. What are the rules around variable lease payments? So variable lease payments that depend on an index or a rate 
are included in the initial measurement of the lease liability and they are required to be initially measured using the index or rate as at the commencement date. Take note also that amounts expected to be payable by the lessee and the residual value guarantees are also to be included in this valuation. Also, variable lease payments that are not included in the measurement of the lease liability are recognized in profits or loss in the period in which the event or condition that triggers the payment occurs unless the costs are included in the carrying amount of another asset under another standard. Remember this, it's very important. Now this should cover all the accounting requirements by the lessee. How is the lessor required to account for leases by? The first is that lessors are required to classify each lease as either an operating lease or as a finance lease. A lease will be classified as a finance lease if it transfers substantially all the risk and rewards incidental to the ownership of an underlying asset. In any other case, this will be classified as an operating lease. What are some indicators? What are some measures? What are some signs that will show that a finance lease exists? So these indicators include things such as the first is where the lease transfers ownership of the assets to the lessee by the end of the lease term. The next is where the lessee has the option to purchase the asset at a price which is expected to be sufficiently lower than the fair value at the date the option becomes exercisable. But take note that at the inception of the lease, it should be reasonably certain that this option will be exercised. The next sign or indication of a finance lease will be that the lease term is for the major part of the economic life of the asset, even if title is not transferred. And then, at the inception of the lease, the present value of the minimum lease payment amounts to at least substantially all of the fair value of the lease asset. And finally, the lease asset should be of a specialized nature such that only the lessee can use them without any major modifications being made. So still on accounting by the lessor, what are the specific rules? Upon the commencement of the lease, a lessor shall recognize assets held under finance lease as a receivable at an amount equal to the net investment in the lease. Also, a lessor is required to recognize finance income over the lease term of a finance lease based on a pattern reflecting a constant periodic rate of return on the net investment. Now, for a manufacturer or a dealer lessor, at commencement, they are required to recognize selling profits or loss in accordance with their policy for outright sales and the IFRS 15 revenue from contracts with customers. And then finally, under operating leases, a lessor is required to recognize operating lease payments as income on a straight line basis or if more representative of the pattern in which benefit from the use of the underlying assets is diminished, then they can use another systematic basis. Let's talk about sale and lease back transactions now. Here, we are saying to determine whether the transfer of an asset is accounted for as a sale and entities required to apply the requirements of IFRS 15 revenue from contract with the customers for determining when a performance obligation is satisfied. Now, if an asset transfer satisfies IFRS 15's requirements to be accounted for as a sale, the seller should measure the right of use asset at the proportion of the previous carrying amount that relates to the right of use retained. Accordingly, the seller will only recognize the amount of gain or loss that relates to the rights transferred to the buyer. Finally, if the fair value of the sale consideration does not equal the asset fair value or if the lease payments are not market rate, then the sales proceeds are required to be adjusted to fair value either by accounting for prepayment or additional financing. IFRS 16 provides for several disclosure requirements. All of them have the sole objective of ensuring that information will be provided in the notes that together with the information provided in the statement of financial position, the statement of profit or loss, and the statement of cash flows will give a basis for users to assess the effect that leases have on the reporting entity as a whole. 
So this has been our summary of IFR 16 leases. If you like this summary, don't forget to smash that like button and don't forget to share this video within your entire network. I will catch you in the next summary video.